Welcome back to Understanding Economics. In our first lesson, we identified four basic questions that a course in political economy would have to answer, would have to come to grips with. They are, why is there poverty in a society that has great capacity to produce wealth? Why are there boom-bust cycles? What can be done about them? Is it necessary to trade between equity and efficiency in our economic policy? And by the same token, is it necessary to trade between prosperity and environmental sustainability? Those are our four questions. Our task today is to define the terms we're going to be using for the rest of our study. We're going to define terms and use them consistently throughout the rest of our analysis of political economy. And it's very important to know what we're talking about. So we're going to spend some time and carefully examine our definitions and the, and the rationale for them. A definition is a clear boundary placed around a group of things that share the same characteristics. Now, of course, you can define things differently depending on what you're analyzing, what you're trying to find out. Ideally, a thing is either inside or outside of the boundary of definition. There's no ambiguity. However, the same thing can be defined in different ways, depending on what it is we're trying to find out. Let's look at a few examples. Here's a picture of a few animals. An owl, a snake, a fox, a cat, a cow, and a squirrel. Now, do those things all go in the same group? Well, they're all animals, yes. But is there any other subgrouping we can make? Well, let's say we want to define them as the group of things, of animals that eat mice. That would leave out the cows and the squirrels. Uh huh, okay. So here's another group. Parakeets, iguanas, monkeys, guppies, giraffes, hyenas. Another group of animals. Is there any subgroup we can make of things that have something in common? Well, what about animals that are commonly kept as pets? That would pretty much leave out the giraffes and the hyenas. I don't know anybody who keeps a hyena for a pet. I think you're starting to get the idea. Here's one other one, maybe a little more obscure. Plumbers, pickup trucks, Donald Trump, Barack Obama, cats, Star Trek. What's in common there? How can we group those? Well, what if we're looking for things that are frequent subject of Facebook memes? I don't really see too many Facebook memes about plumbers and pickup trucks. So there's our definitional boundary. Our task here is to come up with a set of definitions that will help us to find out what we want to find out. So let's start at the beginning with two basic self-evident economic axioms. When you think about them, you'll realize that they really are always true, although students often try to come up with counterexamples. First is, human desires are unlimited. The second is, people seek to satisfy their desires with the least exertion. Now, human desires really are unlimited. You might think you have everything you want. Perhaps you're a Zen master and you've transcended desire. But you could always get the things you have with less work, more free time, more sleep, better food, etc. Whatever makes life better for you. And anyway, if you get all the things you want today, does that mean you'll have no desires tomorrow? So human desires really are unlimited. And what do we mean when we say that we want to satisfy our desires with the least exertion? Well, exertion is work. It's irksome toil. It's like standing in the toll booth all day in the rain. It's things that you would only do if you were paid to do and you wouldn't choose to do for fun. All of us want to get the things we want with a minimum of irksome toil or exertion. Now, of course, what constitutes exertion is different for different people. Some people do things just for fun that you couldn't pay other people to do. Some people run marathons just for fun. So what constitutes exertion is different, and that gives us great advantage in economic relations because it makes exchange very powerful. Everyone wants to exchange the things they have for the things that they want more. 
Okay, so what is the purpose of economic behavior? To satisfy human desires by producing valuable goods and services. Now, the fact that what constitutes exertion is different for every people, that our values are subjective, makes that word valuable important. Space and time is limited, but our desires are not. And we want to satisfy our desires with the least exertion. This means that how much something is worth to us depends on two things. One, how much we want it, and two, how much work we have to do to get it. Now, how much I want it is totally subjective. It just shows that we're individuals and we want what we want. That's a given. So in terms of economic value, number two is the important part. In the economy, the value of something is how much work, how much labor or products of labor or valuable stuff you have to give up in order to get that thing. By making that statement, we proclaim our agreement, in this one thing anyway, with modern economics and our disagreement with Karl Marx, David Ricardo, and some of the other classical economists who believed in the labor theory of value. They believed that the value of something is the amount of labor that went into making the thing. But that really doesn't work because, well, your granddaughter put a lot of labor into her pretty picture, but nobody wants to buy it. Or you paid $2,500 in 1995 for that awesome personal computer. Today it is worth diddly squat. And anyway, this piece of land has lots of value and yet absolutely zero went into producing that. So value has to be the amount of labor that people are willing to give in exchange for things rather than the amount of labor that went into producing them. Okay, the stuff we produce to satisfy our desires is called wealth. So we're going to play a little game of one of these things is not like the others to come up with our precise definition of wealth. I hope this will help us to see. All right, here are some things. Which one of these is not like the others? A chainsaw, fresh vegetables, silver coins, a musical performance. Well, it's a musical performance, isn't it? Because the other three are material things, and a musical performance is an experience. You could buy a record, perhaps, of the performance. That would be a material thing. But the performance itself is not a material thing. It's an experience. Okay, here's another group. A book, a truck, a computer, a piece of land. Which of those things is not like the others? Well, a piece of land was not produced by labor. It's part of the natural world. The other things were produced by labor, okay? One more time. A dinner, a bed, a hat, a hundred dollar bill. Which one of those is not like the others? This might be a little, little trickier, but you realize that you can directly satisfy your desires with some of those things, a dinner, a bed, a hat. There are things you want that actually satisfy your desires. But you can't really satisfy your desires with a hundred dollar bill. Money is a medium of exchange. It doesn't satisfy our desires. It allows us to exchange for the things that will satisfy our desires. And so there's an important distinction in political economy between wealth and money. Because money doesn't really satisfy our desires. It's a medium of exchange. Let's do one last one, and then we'll sum up. A hundred dollar bill, fresh vegetables, a piece of land, a kid's cute picture. Well, I think you'll recall from our discussion which one of those is not like the others, don't we? The kid's cute picture, while we love it and we have it up on our refrigerator, it doesn't have exchange value. It doesn't affect the distribution of wealth because no one's willing to exchange anything for it. So now we've looked at the four essential characteristics of wealth in political economy. To be defined as wealth, to be classified as wealth, something has to be a material thing, which is produced by human labor, satisfies human desires, and has exchange value. It must meet all four of those criteria. And that's very important. You can immediately see what wealth in political economy is not. It's not simply the set of all valuable things. 
Land is not produced by human labor. Money does not satisfy human desires. And what about that musical performance or the things that a doctor or lawyer does for you? Certainly they're valuable. In some cases we pay a lot of money for these things. They don't result in a physical product, so we call them services. And in the economy we produce goods and services. So when we talk about the distribution of wealth in society, that's really shorthand for the distribution or assignment of ownership of valuable goods and services. Now here's an illustration that's been used for many years to show how the factors of production work together. You got your farmer carrying his goods in a wheelbarrow. The three factors of production, okay? Let's talk about them for a second. You got labor. In political economy, we define that as all human exertion in production. It could be physical exertion, it could also be mental exertion. Anything that human beings do in the production of goods and services comes in the category of labor and is that factor of production. The payment that goes to labor in production we call wages. The second factor is capital. Now there are many confusions about how we define capital and we're going to go into that in some depth later in the course. In our course, we define capital as wealth. And remember, wealth is stuff that satisfies all those four criteria of wealth. It's physical things produced by labor that satisfy human desires and have exchange value. So capital is wealth that is used in production or wealth that is in the course of exchange. All the tools, the equipment, the factories, and the inventory on store shelves, these are all wealth that are in the process of production. That's what we call capital in political economy. And the payment to capital is called interest. That's also a controversial term. It's confused with the interest that's paid to borrowed money, for example. And there's a lot of, of disputation about how we use the term. What we're calling in this course is economic interest is the return to capital goods in production. And then there's the ground the land. And in political economy we define land as the entire material universe except for human beings and their products. So economically land is not just the ground under our feet, it's any form of natural, natural opportunity. That can include such things as rights to water underneath the land, or rights to fly over space or orbital paths or rights to broadcast frequencies. Anything that is a natural opportunity and is a gift of nature comes under the economic definition of land. And in political economy, we term the return that the owners of land get for making land available in production as rent. The sum of rent plus wages plus interest, in other words, what the guy is carrying in his wheelbarrow, encompasses the full total of wealth that is distributed in society. Okay? Now, the great usefulness of this three-factor scheme is that the factors are mutually exclusive. This allows us to clearly distinguish what goes to each factor, and it allows us to trace the changes in this distribution as society evolves. Now, this is not the only scheme of definitions that there is in economics. And I want to mention another prominent one, just so we can see the contrast in what we're doing and what Econ 101 generally does. Many basic economics textbooks textbook, will tell you that there are four factors. The fourth factor being entrepreneurship. Entrepreneurship is defined as the decision-making, the risk-taking aspects of management of business operations. And it's seen as being different enough from basic labor to qualify as a separate factor of production. We don't consider it that way because we can see that entrepreneurship isn't functionally different from labor. It's a form of human exertion and some entrepreneurship makes great amounts of money, some not so much at all. So there isn't really any functional difference in terms of distribution of wealth between entrepreneurship and labor. In your Econ 101 text, the return to entrepreneurship will tend to be called profit. 
That's problematic for us in understanding the distribution of wealth in society because profit could come from any combination of the three factors. The scheme of definitions of four uh, factors of production makes a whole lot of sense if your goal is to analyze personal distribution. In other words, as an entrepreneur, how much do I have to give to the various inputs to production, the factors, so that I can have the greatest return to me, the entrepreneur? A whole lot of research is done and a whole lot of ink is spilled on that question, which of course is very, very valuable to entrepreneurs in the economy. Econ majors everywhere study it. But it isn't our concern here, at least not our primary concern. Our primary concern is why there is poverty. And so we want to know how the aggregate wealth of society is distributed among the factors of production. And that's what we're going to begin to examine in our next session. Thanks for watching. Understanding Economics is a presentation of the Henry George School of Social Science. Video work has been done by the excellent Uladzimur Taukachu. In our next lesson, we explore whether there are actual laws that govern the distribution of wealth in society.